Uh, my name is Martin Mikelski. I'm one of the three directors here. And uh, I'm really glad to introduce one of ours, the best of ours, Meg Crawford. Um, she is here and will leave shortly, but hopefully in three weeks she will never leave again. <laughs> and we're really glad you're here, Meg. So Meg did her PhD in Harvard and already worked on uh, really interesting topics, interactions of groups of animals, monkeys in the forest, really tough subject, really difficult to do at the time, pioneered a new direction in anthropology. That's what she continued for quite a long time, first in Princeton, uh, Smithsonian a lot, uh, partially at the Max Planck, and then uh, went to Davis, where she continued all of that, um, got some really nice advances with new technologies on primates, uh, new findings, and I'm sure you'll tell us about that. And we are really glad that you're continuing that here in Constance on the social systems of animals in general. Thanks for the lovely introduction, Martin. It is lovely to be here, or at least to be en route to here. I'm physically here. My stuff is, I think, passing my field site in Panama at the moment on a big cargo ship, and my family is somewhere in the world. But we'll be here soon, and I'm really excited to finally be here and get to get started and get to know this amazing community of researchers based in Constance, which I think has really, it's been an amazing conference in general. Lots of really exciting work being presented, um, and it's been a wonderful introduction, both to the group here in Constance, but as well as to the broader community. And so, Thank you so much for inviting me to give this talk. And I also wanted to take a moment to really thank Carla, Nora, and Katya, who've done such an amazing job organizing. I mean, everybody, anyone who's ever worked on putting a conference like this together knows how much work it is. So thank you guys for making everything run so smoothly. So I'm excited today to get to tell you a little bit about, both about what I've been working on in the past, but really more focused on where I'm excited to be going in the years to come. Um, and so I'm an anthropologist by training, and so what that means is that I came to the field of animal behavior from the perspective of trying to understand what non-human animals can tell us about what it means to be a human animal. Um, and when you think about humans, human primates, some of our most striking characteristics have to do with the complexity of our social interactions um, and the ways in which we rely on group level cooperation and collective behavior in our daily lives. Um, and so the question that really motivates me as a scientist uh, is to try to understand how we became, how we came to be an animal that was so defined by our collective behaviors, our traits, our collective adaptations. Um, and I think that, the, as an animal behavior person, speaking at Animal Behavior Conference, the, the, the starting point for answering that question really lies in understanding, in a comparative approach, in understanding the similarities and differences in how group level behaviors and traits, social organizations emerge um, and emerge in, and, and are maintained and elaborated in the societies of other socially complex animal species. After all, transitions from solitary lifestyles to group living and from loose aggregations into stable, temporally stable, socially differentiated societies have happened a num numerous times over evolutionary history. And complex sociality is a widespread adaptation taxonomically. But primates, in particular, but primates in general, and humans in particular, have really made complex social living a cornerstone of our adaptation. We all live our lives embedded in really complex social networks um, that are multifaceted. So we have different kinds of relationships with different, with different individuals, and these relationships are very dynamic. They're constantly changing and mutating over time, um, evolving, as we live our lives. And what all of this means is we're a species who is unambiguously dependent on our larger social group for our survival and for our reproduction. And it means that, sort of put another way, um, we create our own collective ecology. The actions and interactions of group mates combine to create a new social environment that we all live in. And so 
I think that what this means is that we need to work towards an understanding, a science of the sociome, understanding how the actions and interactions of individuals scale, combine, to create the societies in which we live. So what does that look like? Well, I think broadly there are four main challenges in terms of thinking about how individual behavioral predispositions combine to create, at a larger scale, the societies that we live in. First of all, at approximate level, we need to understand why some individuals behave differently than others. Why is this guy sort of up towards the front of this mobbing group of mongoose? Well, this guy kind of looks like he wished he was anywhere but where he was. <laughs> um, and we also need to understand to what degree these differences are genetically based versus being context-dependent behavioral plasticity. We also need to understand the contingency of the behavioral choices that animals make. So understanding, for example, how this guy's hesitancy impacts the choice of this animal to either participate or not in this mobbing event. How, how the choices I make influence what you choose to do. And how those decisions combine to create this group phenotype of, in this particular case, this group behavior of the group mobbing a snake. And finally, and perhaps most challengingly, we need to start to understand how these group level traits, to what degree these group level traits impose novel selective pressures and how, in fact, they, how in fact they change the ways that individuals, that individuals are behaving and also how selection is favoring particular behavioral traits in individuals. So all of these questions um, are challenging. There are reasons that these are still questions that we are working hard, and there's been a lot of work here at this conference, in fact, that's been exciting to hear about working on these kinds of questions. Um, and I really strongly believe in the importance of combining both la carefully controlled laboratory work with a field-based perspective, studying these kinds of questions in socially, ecologically, and therefore evolutionarily relevant contexts for these animals. And when you're talking about animals with complex societies, um, oftentimes that can be quite challenging to, to recreate or to work within this, the areas where they're living. Um, and within primatology in particular, or any sort of any field where you're doing observational-based research on habituated animals, in some ways the very methods that we use hinder our ability to ask the kinds of integrative questions uh, that, that, that I'm interested, that we're, I think we're all broadly interested in. So for, with habituated animals, what you frequently do is collect very detailed information on what, for example, a focal animal is doing. You know a lot about what, what that one individual is doing. You know who that one individual is interacting with but you miss out on the broader social context of what is going on. And so, just broadly speaking, you, you miss a whole part of, a, a huge part of what, what you're interested in when it comes to these larger scale group level events. We also um, are missing theory. So a lot of theory, there, we have a tremendously rich body of theory, for example, about both collective motion, how collective motion works, collective, how foraging, animal foraging decisions get made. Um, but expand, expanding that out to these kind of interactive decisions where groups are coming to consensus is still an area that requires more work. So, gen, so, so broadly, we need to improve both our empirical methods, we need new ways of asking questions, we need new theoretical frameworks that help us, that help us ask the right questions, and finally, for any questions that you want to ask about social diversity, you're inherently interested in variation among individuals in the same group as well as variation between groups and populations. And all of that requires a level of scientific investment of, temp of time and energy and effort that rarely can be done by a single group or institute. It's inherently a collaborative enterprise. And so, broadly speaking, these are the three areas where I think we need to, we need to make progress in order to tackle these challenges. Um, and that really is going to be the focus of what my department here in Constance is going to be trying to do. So today, what I want to do um, is talk to you a little bit about some of the work we've done, some of the work that we're doing, 
um, and where also we hope to go. So I actually didn't start out studying baboons. Uh, I started out studying capuchin monkeys at, with Martin uh, in Panama. Um, I came to baboons rather late in my scientific career, and it's been a really fun change to start studying a new animal, which brings new questions to mind. I think changing study system is such a valuable thing to do upon occasion because it gives you new insights, it prompts new ideas, and while challenging, it's really fun too. Um, so baboons are kind of a model species for, 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 social, for, for research on sociality, in part because they are so well studied. People have been working on baboons for decades, 40, 50, maybe even 60 years, um, recording long-term data on interactions of, of individually recognized animals who are followed throughout their lifetime. Um, and baboons are, for that reason, a really interesting place to start asking more complex questions because we already have a tremendous basis of knowledge about them. So just to give for, for those of you who don't know much about baboons, baboons live in relatively large multi-male, multi-female groups. Um, and I say large, but actually there's huge variation, order of magnitude variation in how big groups can be. They can be as small as 10 to 12 individuals and as big as 100, 150 animals. Um, so tremendously variable in that way. They live across a range of ecologies. Um, I'm specifically talking about I specifically say olive baboons. Olive baboons can be found in open savanna. They can be found in dense tropical forest. Um, and as you'll probably notice from this picture, they have quite extreme sexual dimorphism. Males are much larger than females. And their societies are really organized around a strict dominance hierarchy, where dominance has a major impact on pretty much every aspect of a baboon's life. Um, and one of the challenges these baboon troops face in their lives is that they, they are a cohesive unit. They move together as a group across the habitat as they search for food, for water, um, as they try to avoid predators and find safe places to sleep. So who decides where they go? In any system where you have this much heterogeneity in body size, this much heterogeneity in dominance rank, there are going to be conflicts of interest over where the best place to go for me is versus the rest of you. This was a question that really got me interested in working with baboons, in part because, well, they're terrestrial, which means that you can do things, they're, they're an easier system to work with than the arboreal monkeys I had been working with previously. So for a baboon, thinking about where he wants, he or she wants to move in the habitat, um, presumably this is a multi-factor decision. There are ecological, environmental considerations going on. There, there are social considerations going on. And then there's the internal state of that individual as well. A lot of these facets, however, are really hard to quantify in ways that allow us to ask questions about the choices that individuals are making. So we went, I left Panama and went to Kenya um, because with baboons it was feasible to capture an entire group of animals and put GPS collars on them. I should qualify that. It's not quite an entire group. It was most of the adults. There was these two males who just, anyway, two individuals we just couldn't get. They fought their way out of the traps. Anyway, um, and we were able to track them in very high resolution. So what you're seeing here is a group of baboons moving, sort of, at, it's, it's sort of mid-morning here. Um, they're colored by their age sex class. And by tracking with, at, at one second resolution, what we're able to get is these very detailed information about where they're moving on the landscape, but also how they're moving in relation to one another. And working with Ari Strandberg Peshkin and Damian Farine and Ian Cousin, we were able to complement this data set with drone-based reconstruction, three-dimensional reconstruction of the habitat that these baboons were moving through. So flying a drone over and creating this three-dimensional map, we both know sort of the, the environmental context, as well as the social context of the decisions these animals are making. So what matters to a baboon? Well, it turns out that yes, indeed, it is a multifaceted decision-making process. Lots of things matter to baboons. Um, and some of them are environmental. So we heard earlier today about how much elephants don't like walking up mountains. It turns out that baboons don't particularly like walking uphill either. Um, they also like walking along roads, presumably because they're easy, and they don't like dense areas, presumably because 
of predators. Um, but the single most important factor in determining where a baboon is going to move next um, has to do with the social context of its group, and specifically how many other members of its group were there immediately before it. So there's a, there's a, so, there's a very strong social aspect to these movement decisions. When you're thinking about social, social, uh, so, social drivers of movement, we sort of come back to this question of influence. Who are you going to follow? Who are, who are you going to um, not follow? Ignore, I guess, would be the way to say that. Um, and we, we use the movement data to tease out influence from the behavior of the animals that we were studying by looking at these, what we call pulls and anchors. So a pull is when an animal moves, if, if an animal moves away, do I follow? If so, I was pulled. That's in contrast to being anchored. I moved away, you didn't follow me, so I came back. So taking all of this GPS data and extracting these dyadic patterns of interaction, these pulls and anchors, um, what we found was that actually, surprisingly, at, at a one-on-one -on -one level, um, None of the individual level metrics that we thought might be important, so dominance, dominance matters for baboons. It turns out that being dominant does not make you more likely to be a successful puller. Um, age and sex class, you might think that older individuals who have more knowledge might be more likely to sort of be successful influencers. Uh, also not showing up in our data. The strongest pattern on this one-to-one -one level that we find has to do with how individuals walk, not who they are. So if you're walking in a straight, relatively straight, relatively directed manner, you're much more likely to successfully pull your group than if you're walking in a more tortuous or slower way. So how you walk matters matter than who you are. More important than all of that, though, has to do with sort of the preponderance, what the group as a whole wants. What we found evidence for when we looked at sort of situations where members of the group were pulling in different directions was that the total number of animals who wanted to, who were going in one direction versus the other was the key metric, the strongest predictor of pulling. So, in general, baboons seem to follow a majority rule. They go where the majority of their group wants to go. Now, all of this is, was, was, was really fun and exciting, but it had this major frustration for us, which is that at the end of the day, we don't really understand what's motivating any of these individuals to want to go left versus right, to, to that tree versus over towards that river. We don't understand their motivations. Um, and what that means is it's really hard to interpret some of the patterns that we see. So we've been working really hard on trying to figure out how you fix that. And what we've come up with is sort of come to the conclusion is that an experimental regime is really necessary, but, but that we can do field-based experiments where we maintain both the size of the area that animals are moving over, as well as many of the natural components. And so we've been working on developing these um, automated feeders that basically can allow or exclude access to particular individuals based on a PIT tag, an RFID tag. This is an idea that Damien Farine and I developed while he was working in my lab. And that was quite a few years ago now, and it's taken us a while. <laughs> it turns out, as with most technological development, there are a lot of stumbling blocks. Um, but what I'm excited to tell you about today is that I get to do more than just show you this picture of what we want to do. So the idea, basically, is that we can use these feeders to create conflicts of interest in the group that we control and therefore that we know about, and that we can then use to test hypotheses about what allows an animal to exert influence. So for example, we create a binary choice. Does the group go left or does the group go right to, to these feeding arrays? Um, and perhaps predicated on a, a subgroup of socially connected individuals wanting to go one direction and an age and maybe dominance matched subgroup of individuals who don't have close social connections wanting to go the other way. Do social connections matter for being able to lead? And so as I said, I'm excited because this is some very new data. It was collected just a few weeks ago. Um, we finally got the feeders up and running and have done a first, first round of experiments. I'm not going to tell you about any final results. Um, but what you're seeing here is our collared troop of baboons coming to one of these two experimental feeding arrays. Um, we provide 
some baseline level of food on the ground for, so that for the whole group, because otherwise the group won't come to the site. Um, and what you're about to see is a successful entrance, a, a female who was coded to be allowed into the feeder. She has to try a few times. I think the click sound freaked her out, but she got there. And here's a male who was coded to be not allowed. <laughs> so I think we may have to do some, increase the sturdiness of our boxes, but in general, um, we can get baboons to come and they will use these feeders. And Roy Harrell has done, has finished a, a sort of preliminary subset of experiments. What you're seeing here is the baboons being tracked with, using these GPS collars at their cliff sleep site, traveling to either the red feeding site, which allows individuals colored red to eat, or the blue feeding site, which allows individuals colored blue to eat. And so what I think is really exciting about this setup is it allows us both to, again, manipulate who wants to go where, manipulate individuals' desires, uh, individuals' motivations, um, and, then, and then also um, look at sort of both the decision about where to go, but also when the group chooses to leave this feeding site to travel to the next. So there's sort of two experiments all built into one here. The other thing that we're trying to do to get, to, to allow us to have better insight into the, the motivations of the individuals that we're studying um, is looking at a slightly different system. So rather than looking at collective motion per se, looking at sleep site choice. And sleep site choice is nice because um, they're, they're a more limited, it's a more discrete set of, set of options that, that the group is choosing among. In theory, our group an individual or a group could choose to go almost anywhere in space. There's a, a subset, maybe 10 to 15 to 20 reasonable sleep sites within their territory. So the parameter, the parameter set is just smaller and more manageable. Um, and there are also some very clean predictions about what baboons might want out of a sleep site. So minimizing exposure to predators or, or parasites, proximity to resources, comfort. Um, I'm calling it comfort, but what I mean is stability of the sites, um, shelter from elements, uh, and then also opportunities for social interaction, affiliative or agonistic. Um, and so this is work that Carter Loft, is, who spoke earlier today, has just, he's just, he's just back from the field. And what we've been doing is um, working to, figure, to create three-dimensional models of the sleep sites that our troop sleeps in so that we can quantify these characteristics accessibility to predators, for example, um, monitoring the stability and the temperature at various sites within the tree, as well as looking at where individuals choose to sleep once they are within a sleep site. So what do they prefer? What matters to a baboon in terms of choosing where they sleep? And how do individuals within a group negotiate what is presumably a set of potential places to sleep that differ in their quality. So what you're seeing here is thermal camera imagery. Um, it's a little blurry from where I am. I'm sorry if it's terribly blurry for you guys. Um, of baboons at their sleep site in the middle of the night. Um, I think this, is, this, this particular video is about three in the morning. Um, and there are a couple things that I want you to notice. First, that we can actually see what the baboons are doing at night. But second, look at how much is going on. There's a tremendous amount of action and interaction of movement within sites. And this was particularly surprising to me because I had just a couple years ago published a paper saying that functionally baboons don't do much at night based on our GPS movement data. <laughs> well, it turns out that they do do stuff at night. It's just perhaps at a smaller spatial scale than we were able to capture. So it's always exciting to be wrong. <laughs> um, this is just, I'm showing this one because it's just a particularly, it's, this is sped up 50 times, so it's a little jerky. But what you're gonna see is just the sheer amount of activity that's going on on this baboon sleeping site over the course of a night. This is a particularly interesting night because you have one group who comes in, you have a second group who actually shows up at the sleeping site partway through. Anyway, what Carter is planning to do with these data eventually is try to tackle this question of not only how are baboons choosing where to sleep on the landscape, but once they've chosen a sleeping site, 
How do they choose their position within the tree or on the cliff? And how, what is the social context? How are those decisions negotiated? Because obviously, this is not a one-shot deal. There is movement, there are displacements. Um, maybe your friend goes to, some, your, your mother goes to sit over there, you follow her. Um, so clearly, this is a highly complex and dynamic decision-making process that he's going to sort of, that he's going to tackle figuring out how to understand. So I talked, a, I talked a little bit about some of the empirical methods that we're using to try to provide new windows um, into how individual decisions create group level behaviors. Um, I want to talk really briefly about some of the work that we're doing, both in creating new theoretical frameworks as well as starting to develop collaborative networks. So it's an obvious statement that group behavior emerges from individual decisions. And in the, foraging theory is nice because it presents a really rich body of work about how individuals are expected to make decisions about what to eat, where to eat, when to eat, when to leave. Um, so, as many of you have heard at various talks today, um, one of the classic models in optimal foraging theory is the, is the marginal value theorem. And it provides predictions about when an individual should leave a particular foraging patch and move on to the next. And it's, the, the model predicts that it should be based on sort of the density of food, of food resources in the habitat, so how long it takes you to travel from where you are to the next, to the next tree in the habitat. Um, and it predicts that you should leave when your average rate of gain reaches that of what, what is available in the habitat in general. Now, of course, when you're foraging as a group, you may have significant inter-individual differences um, in foraging ability. So if you're an older individual, you may be better able to process foods, you may eat faster. If you're a dominant individual, you may have better access and better ability to displace others. And so these gain curves, how much food each individual intakes is, is taking in over the course of its visit in the tree, may look, maybe, maybe have very different shapes. And what that predicts is that individuals within a group will have very different or different desired departure times, different optimal times to leave the tree and start foraging in the next. So what my graduate student Grace has been working on um, is trying to collect both empirical data to look at this question, how do groups decide when to leave patches, and trying to develop theory to think about how you extend what is functionally a solitary a model for solitary individuals to a model for individuals who are having to make consensus decisions. So these animals aren't just reaching their preferred time to leave and going, they have to reach some sort of consensus within their group about when it's time to move to the next patch. Oh. One of the challenges she's facing, as you'll see here, is that this doesn't look a whole lot like this. There are a lot of differences in how real animals forage from what models predict. Um, and in particular, dealing with this issue of asynchronous arrival in the patch and starting to feed, um, there are a whole range of ways in which I think there's room to improve and think about foraging theory from this group perspective that are really exciting. In addition, um, as we start to look deeper into the, into the behavior of these monkeys, in this case it's capuchin monkeys, um, we're finding that their behavior is not really corresponding with foraging theory and some, with, with, with these Question, with foraging theory in some very interesting ways that are likely related to the social dynamics that are going on within the group. So Lucia Torres, who gave a poster here, um, has been looking at how capuchin monkeys behave in various parts of their range in response to the, to the risk that different areas pose to them, the, the threat of intergroup encounters. So capuchins can have quite aggressive, violent intergroup interactions where animals get severely injured and sometimes die that makes these areas between ranges risky. And so, functionally, capuchins are living in a landscape of fear that is being dominated, at least in our system, less by the predators, perhaps, and more by the other groups around them. So foraging theory has a set of predictions about how individuals should modify their behavior when foraging in high-risk situations. Specifically, they're expected to leave patches earlier than, than predicted based on optimal foraging theory with higher giving up densities. Interestingly, Lucia's found ex exactly the opposite. So in these sort of risky border areas, capuchins are, in fact, 
completely depleting the trees that they choose, that they forage in. Um, they're, they're not showing this tendency to leave trees earlier with less patch depletion. In fact, it's the opposite. And I think that what may be going on here, this is brand new, and so we, don't, we haven't yet sort of further explored this hypothesis yet. I wonder if this actually isn't a competitive tactic, that by depleting resources in shared areas, you discourage your neighbors from, from going there. You make, those, you make those resources unpredictable and less valuable for that reason. So finally, I just want to do a quick pass through, and I promise two minutes, since I'm almost done with time, um, about a new discovery that my group has made off the coast of Panama um, that I'm quite excited about, and that I think really is an example of a place where we're never going to understand what's going on here without large-scale cooperation across groups who study capuchins, both the grass isle and robust species. So what you're seeing here is, is a white-faced capuchin monkey, Cebus capuchinus, smashing open a nut with a rock. Um, it's not all that special in the sense that lots of monkeys use hammer stones to open nuts, but this particular genus had never been observed performing this behavior, which is weird because they have sort of all the things you'd expect to. They, they have big brains, they engage in all kinds of cultural traditions that, they, that are socially transmitted, um, and they're very manipulative in lots of other ways. So they're sort of a prime candidate, and so it was weird that no Cebus species had ever been observed using stone tools in this way. Um, this is work that's being done by Brendan Barrett, who's going to be a postdoc here in Constance, and Claudia Montesa, who is here, um, and gave a poster on terrestriality in the, these particular monkeys. Um, and this behavior was observed in a small archipelago way off the coast of Panama. And it's interesting uh, because there are three islands in this, in, in this archipelago that have capuchins. And I used to be able to say, and only, only monkeys on this island actually do this st stone tool use behavior. In fact, we just discovered a new population that does it. But it tends to be, it's very patchy and very localized. So there's some big questions that rise out of this. Um, first of all, why don't all capuchins on Hikaron use stone tools? So after two years of camera trapping, uh, tool use remains highly localized in one area of this main island where we're working, even though there are capuchins everywhere. And only males. We have at this point, hundreds of thousands of images of capuchins using stone tools to open nuts. Not a single one of them is female. Lots of little, little males, lots of big males. It doesn't seem to be size related, but the females don't do it. So to understand why you see behavioral variation like this, behavioral variation in cultural innovations of this kind is really going to require, um, I think, a collaborative effort. And I'm going to leave it at that because I'm out of time, and I want to have enough time to say this, which is that, broadly speaking, I think that large-scale collaborations of the kind that I think is going to be necessary to understand capuchin stone tool use is needed for lots of questions related to the emergence and functioning of animal societies. And so we have this collaborative research grant. Um, it's going to support salary for two to three postdocs who are working together as a, as a team to tackle a question that they couldn't tackle alone. So what we're looking for, we're not taxonomically biased. We're not looking for, I'm not looking for someone who does what I do. <laughs> what we're looking for is a group of people who is combining their expertise in ways that allow them to do more than they could do alone and to tackle questions that wouldn't be answerable without that collective effort. So I want to end by saying a special thank you to my group who's coming, who I've worked with over the years and who is, whose work I've talked about today, um, many of whom are here and are coming to Constance. So thank you for following me on this crazy jaunt. <laughs> um, and I'm happy to take questions. Hello, uh, thanks very much for the talk. And I was interested in when you show that the monkey sleeping behavior, they looked so active and alive all through the night. How is their sleep or what's known about their sleep behavior? I'm going to repeat the question to make sure I understood it. You, you were saying that the, the baboons on the cliffs looked very active throughout the night, and you were wondering about their sleep? Yeah. Yeah. So I think that's a really interesting question. I mean, as I'm sure you know, all of those sleep monitoring devices that 
some people use to obsessive compulsively track how well or poorly they're sleeping. It's functionally the same technology that's being used in these collars. It's, 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 it's accelerometers. Um, and so I think that we haven't yet looked at this, but this question of how well are they sleeping, what are, the, what are the units of sleep, should probably be extractable from the data that we have. Um, one of the things that I wonder about is the degree to which sleep gets disrupted, as a fun, like what social sleep gets disrupted, and the degree to which you have sort of this desire for proximity for a whole bunch of reasons related to safety and thermoregulatory, thermoregulation, but perhaps a, dis, a desire for separation so as to have high quality sleep. Um, I think we also recognize increasingly with ourselves the importance of sleep for good cognitive functioning. And I'm, I think it would be really interesting to think about how, what impact sleep quality has on sort of performance on other tasks throughout the, throughout the day. Do sleep deprived monkeys suffer from the same issues that we all do? Thank you. Uh, hi, Meg, thanks for the great talk. Uh, Thanks. I was just wondering when you say that uh, who does one choose to follow depends upon the walking style mm -hmm. or the type as opposed to who the individual is. Yep. But aren't these two, uh, do you have any evidence that they are not correlated or rather that individuals do not have specific walking styles consistently over days? Yeah, so we... For a same habitat. Right. So we do find that there are, of course, size-related differences in, in, in locomotor capacity, right? So your leg, your leg length has an impact, sort of a physic, just a pure physics, an impact on what your stride rate is, what your stride length is. Um, and we do see characteristic walking profiles for our animals um, with, you know, th that basically is related to their size. Big animals walk like big animals, small animals walk like small animals. Um, we don't find, I mean, if, if it were true that, um, I, I don't think that we have specifically looked at questions like tortuosity, specifically controlling for habitat type um, within, in, like, uh, looking for individual level differences in that way yet. Um, I'm trying to think if, the, if I, I think that were that to explain the pattern, we would see stronger like when we look at these pull networks, pull and anchor networks, we would find certain individuals popping out as being consistently, regularly followed. And that's not what we see. We see a lot of, you know, basically any individual can successfully pull. There are, there are differences in how frequently they're successful, but it's not as strong as I would expect if it were purely a function of that. Yeah. I had somebody... Um, you mentioned that the pulling depends on how they're moving. Is there anything that predicts how effective an animal is as an anchor? It's a really good question. Um, and I don't know that we've looked at it from quite that way before. If we've looked at sort of the tendency to not follow, basically the tendency to anchor. Um, but yes, I think, I mean, so one of the things that we definitely notice in the data is this sort of, like when you're just watching the visualizations, it seems like there's this like inertia that gets broken, like this sort of friction um, at the beginning of a move sequence, uh, which is likely being driven at least in part by these animals who are just not moving. Um, so yeah, that would be worth doing. We haven't done it yet. <laughs> So I was wondering about the marginal value theorem mm -hmm. approach that you use, yep. because it kind of assumes that they want to continue foraging, yes. but then the, the time budget is also grooming and resting, and so yep. how can you incorporate this? Yeah, so it certainly is complex in that mar mar many of the optimal foraging models fail to take into consideration that animals satiate, and that they are also doing other things and trading off all of these various needs in their day. Um, we, what we do is we, we restrict our data to a subset where they do a feeding tree to feeding tree movement, so where they, where they do continue foraging. Um, what that means is that the data tends to be in the morning um, when they're hungry. I think we could do a better job of restricting our data set down to a, a specific time window in the morning when foraging really does seem to be the primary thing driving them. But it is certainly true that there are other factors c 
calling on the primate's attention, um, and foraging is not the only thing that they're trying to maximize. Yeah. And also, the basic fact that they're probably not optimal foragers. So, yeah. So, hi Meg. <laughs> Very nice talk. So, uh, I had a question that relates the your finding on uh, the polling, that where individuals that walk fast and straight are better yep. pullers, and so, how does that relate to the, some of the other things you talked about, like this manipulation that you've, uh, you're doing now and the, uh, uh, and the uh, optimal foraging theory? Because it could be that you know, an individual who is you know, more hungry or has been frustrated because it's the, you know, it's the red color, can't access the food, it will manipulate the group or affect the group by walking faster and straighter. So you can actually try to relate the individual's recent experience to how hard it tries to pull the others. Have you looked at that? We haven't, we haven't looked at that, that yet, but yes, I mean, I think what I think is exciting about that particular result is it does suggest a mechanism by which individuals and in particular any individual could influence the group and the group's decision. Um, and it might be related to, as you say, to hunger. You might walk in a more directed manner when you're hungry. It may also in, relate to information. So it might provide a very effective way of signaling sort of sureness about your desired direction. Um, we haven't sort of dug into those, but I think they're both really interesting. So, one last. Question. One last. Okay. Hi, Meg. Thanks for the talk. Yeah. Um, with the monkeys that were in uh, depleting the trees, sort of on the ba boundaries of the territories, mm -hmm. um, and you said that that might be sort of a strategy for uh, reducing sort of overlap and, and conflict in those areas. Mm -hmm. Could it also just be that? Those are resources that there's higher competition for, and so they know that either they eat it now or they lose out on it. And if so, how would you? How could you Tease maybe those tell apart? It? Yeah, yeah. So, I think our assumption would have been that those those resources. So I have some data from my PhD, which shows that in intergroup conflicts, you have higher defection in fights that happen in these interstitial areas. Um, and one possible explanation for that is that they just value these areas less, perhaps because they're used by two groups, so they're less certain and they're just depleted. Um, interestingly, and I haven't completely wrapped my head around what this means. <laughs> so the data that Grace and Lucia pulled together on this shows that trees in those areas actually have much more, like significantly more ripe fruit than trees in the center of ranges, suggesting that they're less used, less frequently used, but that when they get used, they do get depleted completely. And it may be related to the uncertainty, you know, something in the center of your home range that you eat half of, it's still probably going to be there when you get back at the edge, maybe not, but it's still, I don't know of any good theory that explains why that should, it sort of makes logical sense, but it, it does not jive with my understanding of origin theory. So, yeah. so thanks Thank very you. much. Uh, wonderful.